right. Well, welcome to the fourth issue or episode of the Ask an Expert series. My name is Barb Trailer, and I'm the host of the series and the Wooden Boat Festival director. We have a great show for all boat owners and anyone thinking about buying a boat, creating your vessel stewardship plan, or how to plan your boat's future. This is such an important topic. We love to see people buy boats and we want to make sure they're prepared for what boat ownership is really like so that they're successful. Andy and Zach have created tonight's presentation for that exact thing, to help people thoughtfully prepare for the, their boat for the long term. Emerald Marine has been a longtime supporter of the Maritime Center, so it's really fun to be able to showcase his expertise tonight. We're really excited to have you both. I'm sure that we'll learn a lot. Thanks so much for being here, Andy and Zach. For having us. Um, Andy and I were just talking about how we had initially planned to do this at the festival in person, and uh, we wished that uh, we could have done that, but hopefully in the future, we will get that opportunity. In the meantime, thanks for being here on Zoom with us. Um, we're gonna start with introductions briefly. Uh, Andy's gonna introduce himself and me, myself, uh, and then we'll launch into it a little further. Yeah, welcome to Emerald Marine. Fabulous offices here. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a boat right and um, boat builder uh, for the, almost the last 40 years now. Uh, I came up in the trade around Olympia, um, um, and I have a lot of people to thank for that, um, especially um, my involvement with Evergreen State College and Carl Brownstein, and really um, in trade terms from the Bates Botech, Botech School, who taught so many people around Puget Sound. How to be competent boat builders, um, which is no more, but um, really we have a we're standing on the shoulders of giants um, in terms of that legacy. Uh, I've lived in Anacortes though for the last 25 years, and um, we have a small shop here that uh, specializes in um, new construction, restoration, and repair. Um, and my name is Zach again. I grew up on Whidbey Island. Um, I'm a little bit younger than. I cut my teeth on a schooner adventurous. I worked for her for many years. I sailed on schooners back in Camden, Maine. I went to the Northwest School of Wooden Boat Building. I went to Skagit Valley Community College's Marine Tech Program. And in 2017, I started my own marine surveying practice, Kingspoke Marine Surveying, um, after apprenticing with David Jackson, who maybe some of you will know. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. I still live on Whidbey Islands and uh, it's, my involvement surveying wooden boats that often brings me in contact with Andy and his shop. And that's, that's sort of um, what brought us to this idea today, uh, uh, creating a stewardship plan for vessels, particularly wooden boats. Uh, and before we get into that, uh, we first just wanna recognize you all, uh, your, your expertise, uh, your experiences with ownership and being stewards for your vessel. We think that's really powerful. We look forward to hearing more about your experiences uh, during the questions portion at the end. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say? Well, I just want to, um, we're encouraging everybody to um, make a living document for their vessel that is a stewardship plan. And, and so we're really just trying to give you the, some tools to help you do what you're already doing better. And likewise, we'd like to hear about your experiences so that we can help organize the tools to pass to other people better ourselves. So um, this is really a dialogue kind of conversation. And um, we hope we're going to be clear about the ideas we um, present, yeah. but you know, please ask questions. Yeah, and just um, on that same note, one of the things to keep in mind is that at the end of this presentation, you're not going to walk away with a formalized document for your vessel. Um, but hopefully, you will have some you know, good leads to follow, good thoughts to ponder. Um, to help you with the process of starting to create your stewardship plan. Um, so just to lay out the rest of this talk, uh, first we're gonna talk about more about how we came to this idea. Uh, then we have developed a diagram uh, and we will go through the diagram and that'll be the actual framework, the thought process for creating your stewardship plan. And, and like we've already mentioned, at the very end, uh, we will take questions and would love to hear about what people are currently doing to help be good stewards of their vessel or tools they might be using or experiences they've had. Why don't I start then? Yeah. Um, just 
Um, I've, I've been doing this long enough now where, um, oh, that's nice, um, where I've seen um, many, many vessels um, change ownership, change circumstances, um, and it, it's turned out where I've actually been sort of the institutional uh, knowledge of the vessel where people come back and want to know what's happened uh, in the history of the boat as far as structure and safety. And then I've um, had to go back to my records. Uh, sometimes they're not very good records uh, or, or help encourage owners to pull out their records and improve their records. And together um, we've made de facto stewardship plans because the boats are changing hands or um, the mission of the boat in the case of a nonprofit organization has been changing. Um, and so, it, it, and in the course of doing that, of course, I've worked with surveyors, um, other professionals, um, insurance underwriters, that's a common one for me is um, uh, making a, a sort of plan that um, makes the insurance underwriter know that the boat is in capable hands um, with a plan moving forward. Um, and so, this um, it has become more and more important, especially in the uh, current insurance climate um, and also with the costs of everything going up and the difficulties of boat ownership going up. And so um, I work with Zach a lot, as you mentioned, and we got going on this idea that uh, maybe we should make this a little more formal for people to use. Well, part of the reason I got into it is uh, being from a, a little bit younger generation, I. I would love to see my generation continue to get involved and be stewards of these wooden boats. Uh, but, but like Andy just mentioned, I'm, I'm watching the climate change. I'm, I'm seeing boats get older and some of them not worth the cost to save anymore. Um, I'm seeing uh, a lot of the great wooden boat experts or just marine trades experts uh, retiring and people not filling that void. Um, and you know, in my work as a surveyor and speaking with insurance agents, uh, I just know that it is a harder climate to get wooden boat insurance, particularly for first time buyers. So uh, what I'm hoping is that if more vessel owners start to create these vessel stewardship plans, uh, that it might help them get into that ownership position or uh, allay any insurance underwriters' concerns about the vessel. And Andy, of course, has mentioned that that has worked in the past with vessels that he's worked with. Um, because ultimately, we have a lot of really beautiful wooden boats in this area, and I just want to see them keep going as long as we can reasonably keep them going. Um, and then, you know, under my surveyor's hat, I Another reason I want this vessel stewardship plan to be more broadly used is I want people to be safe and I want their vessels to be safe. And uh, having sort of a centralized document to keep plans, ideas, manuals, we'll get into all of this. Um, it's going to help them run a safer boat and be safer out on the water. And I really view my profession as one of education where I have the opportunity to go on a, a boat and really tear into it and show people what they're in for or what they have or maybe help them look at things that they hadn't been thinking about before. Um, and I was, just, I was talking with Andy about how I don't have all the knowledge of all of my peers. I, I can't be a full-time rigger, sailmaker, shipwright, engine mechanic. Uh, it's, it's not possible, but I have enough knowledge to know when things don't look right and to help my clients find the experts that they need. So I, it's, I feel it's kind of a first line of defense, uh, an opportunity for education. So those are really the reasons why I wanted to be involved with uh, creating these stewardship plans. And one thing about a stewardship plan is it um, takes some of the guesswork out of ownership um, you know some of the benefits of having a good plan are of course safety as you just mentioned but also um, balancing affordability with using the boat you know so you don't get in a hard spot where uh, you can't make all the repairs or upgrades you need in time for your next cruise or um, you know um, that that kind of thinking 
and then also um, uh, back to the legal requirements thing that you don't spend so much time um, covering your tail on, on the legal requirements if you're staying abreast of it and it's not that much um, work to keep abreast. Yeah, so. yeah. That's, I mean, so, so ultimately, I mean, Andy and I both have different reasons why we're getting involved, but we, we recognized <laughs> over many, many chats that, um, you know, we, we wanted to create this framework for people to use that would be broadly applicable to a variety of boats and a variety of purposes. Purposes might be as you know, differing as a nonprofit organization with a ship, or uh, uh, somebody who goes out day sailing, ocean cruisers, uh, fishing vessels, charter boats. Uh, there are a lot of reasons people have boats, and there are a lot of ways that people use boats. But ultimately, we feel that this process can be used uh, by all of them for the betterment of, of their boat, their safety, and their enjoyment. Yeah, we're really looking out for the boat first, it turns out, professionally. I mean, that's what we speak for the boat in quite a lot of circumstances. Um, and um, we could uh, talk about a nonprofit schooner that we've helped um, organize their thoughts a little bit with a um, sort of a strategic plan like this, uh, where they were able to recognize that um, with a, a bigger um, capacity to carry uh, certification by the Coast Guard, they could earn more money, get more people involved, get more excitement in, in their community, uh, use the vessel more, um, be able to maintain and upgrade it more. And they've gone from, um, you know, a, a pretty low profile um, situation to something that's really meaningful in their community, just by mostly by being organized. Over. Well, and their passion and enthusiasm, but, but without passion. without the organization part, um, they, they, were, uh, they were in need of the organization part. Yeah, and, uh, and we'll talk about this more, but uh, I think Andy's already mentioned that this is meant to be a living document, something that's continually um, reassessed, upgraded, and, uh, and that's exactly what happened with that vessel. They continue to bring more organization to the vessel, and they continue to reevaluate what's needed and make plans so far it's been great um so really what's the core what is what's the the marrow uh, and it's that being a good steward is balancing your resources and goals with your expertise the condition of your vessel and available support that's that's really what we feel like being a good steward is. And so what we're hoping is that this framework will help you accomplish that. Uh, no, I think we're ready to move on. Uh, we're gonna go through this framework and then um, we can, um, we'll review it quickly and then we'll move to questions as how the talk will go, but. All right. Uh, one thing we should oh. mention is that this will be available um, on Zach's web page there under Kingspoke uh, Marine slash resources. And we're going to, um, make some tweaks to this uh, too. So wait a day or two. Yeah. Every time we uh, talk this through, we get some better ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's part of our audience's um, role in this. Um, and there's also a list of um, resources, uh, like educational and um, legal resources that Zach's put together that you might find very useful. Um, and one thing that we have found, it would be really great to have a um, list of Marine trades people um, you know, that we don't have put together. I know the Longship Marine is, work, is working as a resource, but that might be a good thing for the Maritime Center to maybe do um, yeah. in the future. Um, well, and there are, there are like disparate lists, right? Like there's the Port Townsend Marine Trades Association and um, the greater, uh, what is it, Puget Sound Marine Trades, but th there doesn't seem to be like a central list of of resources. And I, I realized that when I started to put together my list of just scratching the surface of all of the amazing talent that's out there, it would just be nice to have one place to go to for it. So, so again, thank you as boat owners because you're supporting all of us in the trades as well. And um, it's, you know, it's, it really is a community. Well, let's, right. uh, yeah, let's launch into it. So we're gonna go spoke by spoke, spark, starting with the King Spoke, uh, which is a really deep and fundamental question. Uh, and then we'll just keep making our way around. Yeah, so why do you own your boat? Um, that 
could be simple. Um, probably it's not so simple. Um, uh, I know that for me, you know, um, being self-reliant, being in nature, wanting to travel, and the romance of it all is really important. But all of those things that we have under the headers are important to me. Uh, but sometimes you don't get to choose uh, what boat you have. Um, you might be inherited. Um, it, it might be a gift. It might, uh, you know, um, you, you might have bought the wrong boat. Um, <laughs> you, um, you know, I bought the wrong boat. Uh, um, so we want you to um, take a minute when you start making um, this plan and uh, be introspective and, and think about um, what what it is that brought you to this boat. Yeah. Yeah, I think when we first started putting this list together, we were, the reason romance is first is because we were both like, oh, yeah, you know, raising sails, the wind in your face, uh, being out on the water. There's just a romance to to owning a boat, uh, particularly for me, a sailboat. But as Andy and I were each answering this question, I was realizing, yeah, I really love the self-reliance part, being able to go out by myself and, um, you know, give myself meaningful and manageable challenges, accomplishing those. Um, but then my wife and I also really love it for building community. It's been a little hard in COVID, but uh, taking our friends out or taking their children out having them sail for the first time is so powerful. So that's just, you know, those are our examples of why you own a boat. But, but as Andy said, uh, you might have inherited a boat. Uh, been given a boat that you really didn't know what you were getting yourself into. Or uh, there's all, all manner of reasons. And, and doing a little bit of that thinking as to why you really want your boat or why you, why you own your boat or why you're thinking about getting your boat because actually this process would really apply well to people who are considering getting a boat as well. Um, it's really a good first step in going through this process. Yeah, one of my early mentors was a sailmaker who said that um, half the reason people have boats is to have a picture of their boat on their desk at work. And uh, I don't think he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I need to take a picture of my boat. Yeah, I, well, I actually have one on my desk. <laughs> anyway. um, so, 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 there's something about boat ownership. Yeah. There is, yeah. So you have uh, you've come to terms with why you own your boat or why you're thinking about getting a boat. And then the next thing we would really love for people to do in this process is to start to consider the competing interests that are inherent in boat ownership. And we tried to list them um, <laughs> all in one spot right there. Now that you know is open to interpretation, but um, there's a there's a lot in those what seven bullet points, and um, sometimes they complement each other, but a lot of times they um, take from each other. Yeah, yeah, they they conflict sometimes, and and so some of those competing interests we've mentioned, you know, the age and condition of your vessel. It's a baseline. Uh, yeah. It's got to be safe um, for what its intended use is. Mm -hmm. um, what is the intended use? Are you wanting to day sail it? Are you wanting to cruise it? Are you wanting to take passengers aboard? Um, what is your financial situation versus how much the boat needs? You know, those can be two very conflicting things. Um, what is your insurance requiring of you? Are you required to have a survey every two years, five years, 10 years? Um, do you want to get better insurance or be covered better by your insurance? What are the laws and regulations for your vessel? And are you meeting them? Um, and <laughs> this one we were talking about earlier, available resources. Uh, you know, we are lucky here in Puget Sound to be surrounded by great boater resources. Uh, but if you have a boat, you know, sometimes I'll get calls from people in Idaho asking me to drive out to do surveys uh, on their like pontoon lake boats. Uh, and we're just lucky in this area to, to be really surrounded by great resources. Um, and the last, the last thing that we had conjured, but that is by no means the last competing interest is owner succession. What do you plan to do with the boat next? Uh, are you going to pass it on? Are you going to sell it? Uh, do you have a crew member that you'd like to, to see take it on? So. Yeah, and the um, um, goal of good stewardship is you know improving the vessel and so that it's available to the next owner or, or 
in its next use. And uh, that, that's another baseline about stewardship, or, or, and especially boats. And they need to be improving or they're, or they're going backwards. So, uh, you know, and we added one too, is uh, moorage is a competing interest too. Yeah. Uh, and avail, uh, avail, you know, your, <laughs> where you live and where your boat lives sometimes can be a, a real challenge. So. Um, so you have recognized why you own your boat, you want your boat, and you have faced some potential competing interests that your, your boat needs and has. Um, and after that, you, you want to set some goals for your boat. Yeah, and those goals need to be um, realistic and they need to be manageable. And so you need to look through the lens of your competing interests and, um, and the reason why you own a boat to make goals that are useful to you. And the, you know, goals should have a time horizon too, a, you know, sort of a near term and a medium term, and then a sort of indefinite horizon um, and be aware of which is what the best you can. Um, and you know, it's, these are great things to think about when you're lying in your bunk, some cozy anchorage too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, what do I want to do? Um, and I, I think that's really helpful because um, then you can sort of build your maintenance plan and your improvement plan and all that around your your goals. And so we'll get to that in a minute. Sure. And and I'll just keep you know beating this nail on the head, which is that. This document is meant to be a fluid document or a, a living document. So the goals that you set in the near term, uh, midterm and long term, well, a few years might pass when you decide to revisit your vessel stewardship plan. But, but what I was saying is you set these goals and a few years go by, maybe you accomplish some of your near term goals and you're in your midterm goals. Uh, maybe it's a good time to reevaluate your stewardship plan set some new short-term goals and some new mid-term goals. Maybe those long-term goals are still the same. But ultimately, it's, it's a living document. We want it to continue to be used and added to. Yeah, and you can achieve your goals, and that's a cause for celebration. I mean, goals aren't endless, so <laughs> that's, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. And then, accordingly, you can plan for the upgrades you might need to, to um, achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. And then you can talk about um, the things you'll do achieving those goals. Are you going to cruise to Alaska? Are you going to go coastwise? Are, are you just going to make sure you uh, get to that lovely spot in the islands you always go to every, the beach you always want to go to every summer to make yourself whole? Um, well, or in my case, I mean, I have a 23 foot fiberglass sloop that lives on a trailer, but in the summertime, I just have a goal of going out at least once a week. And that's my manageable goal. So they can they can be that broad spectrum. Didn't you have a great analogy about marbles? Oh yeah, this is more in the maintenance thing, oh, I'm sure. Okay. So we'll, we'll remind me later. It. Yeah. Uh, others, uh, um, there's community in your goals too, like uh, you know going to the Wooden Boat Festival is the kind of a gathering of the tribe, um, and then Victoria is going to happen this year. So the, there's that lovely way that the fleet goes from Victoria to Deer Harbor to uh, Port Townsend, and that that's a goal of mine every year. I get to you know see my peers and friends, and um, so yeah, that's or well. And my goal actually this year is to get uh, to Desolation Sound and back. It's been a long time, and so mm -hmm. I, I have a very hard and fast goal. Awesome, but yeah. So, well, and that's a great example. Uh, you know, you have set your goal, and then there are going to have to be considerations to meet that goal, right? Where is your vessel at a base level? And are there any things that you need to do in terms of upgrades or planning to get you to that goal? And I think that leads really nicely into the next spoke, which is about seeking expertise. Of course, Andy is a shipwright and well steeped in boat ownership, um, but for newer boat owners, um, who have set these goals, they might not know how to accomplish them. And so that's why we are encouraging people to not only seek out expertise, but develop relationships with those experts. Help, you know, get those experts to help them come up with comprehensive plans to meet their goals. And what does that look like? Do you need to repower before you go offshore cruising? 
do you have an original suit of sales? And well, maybe you come up with a plan with your sale maker to start replacing sales every year, you know, one sale a year. Or when was the last time the mast was out, the rig inspected, um, especially if you're gonna go offshore. So. Well, and as a professional, it's really helpful to me when a boat owner comes in and says, I have this goal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot different than, um, I think I have a problem or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. they could be saying both those things, but, yeah. um, but anyway, the, the goal is really helpful. Um, yeah. um, and then also you're doing, uh, again, by owning a boat, you're keeping all of us in the trades around so that we can all own boats, which uh, I just can't emphasize enough. <laughs> it's, it's really yeah. important. Yeah. Um, and the thing we didn't put on here is um, all the expertise about um, boat uh, handling and, and um, travel too. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's so many periodicals, so many cruising, um, uh, the cruises college, um, cruising guides. Nigel Calder, uh, Nigel, yeah, who spoke Nigel. on the series earlier. Uh, so we left that whole column off, really, but, um, but we, you know, encourage you to keep up on the current, current things. And uh, well, and of course, all last year we've been wondering when the border is going to be open and how to navigate COVID, speaking of the rules and regulations. Right, right. Um, and then uh, the way that that information gets passed down the chain, and the, you know, and how people's experiences at the border have changed, and uh, what we can expect this year. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah. It's a living document. It is. Yeah. And the other thing here that we've put in italics is recognizing owner expertise. And a lot of the times, the owners are the number one expert for their vessel, and they should be if they're not. Um, they know what kind of maintenance they've been doing. They know what maintenance has been done what they want to do with the boat they know their systems better than anybody who just walks aboard for a few hours to do a, a singular job um, and so i think just recognizing your own experience your own expertise and that it's valuable to your boat is is one really important thing and then also recognizing how your expertise fits in with all of these other experts as you move towards creating this more comprehensive stewardship plan yeah, I think that's pretty key because you're the you're the one who has to um, uh, navigate all the information. And uh, you know, experts are paid to have opinions, but they're not the one that's running the boat. Let me check if there's any questions yet. Looks like we're either really boring or really <laughs> succinct. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Um, yeah, so um, you make. You're making a plan and uh, you're improving your vessel all the time. And that's the marble thing. So the analogy I learned is um, the condition of your vessel is like uh, putting marbles in a jar and uh, it, everything you do for the boat, uh, when you, you know, it's, uh, yeah, replace your halyards, uh, change your oil, uh, make sure the stitching on your sails are in good shape, you're putting marbles into that jar. And then uh, when you go out in the streets and you get hammered in a hard chance, um, and the boat and you, mostly you, take a pounding for a while, that costs you a few marbles. But you have plenty of marbles in your jar for ballast and you get home safely and, uh, you know, you might have work to get a few more marbles, but that's yeah. that's how it works. Okay. How it works. Well, let's go back to this then. Yeah. Um, so, you know, at a baseline, you need your hull structure, your propulsion, your, and your steering for safety. I mean, that's just common sense, but it's also from a shipwright's point of view, the things, well, in a surveyor's point of view, the things when you walk up to a boat you've never seen before or one you have, um, you consider the, I do anyway, those things first. Is the, you know, is the hull strong? Is it fair? Is the um, engine, um, does it look like it's been serviced and reliable? Does it look like it's the right size for the vessel? Um, uh, does you know? Does the is the rudder attached well? Um, you know, uh, um, that kind of thing. Uh, is the rig is the rig look well serviced? And then from that baseline, um, you can improve on you know the crew comfort. So that's all your systems, because you know it's good to cook and eat and uh, have a happy crew. That's right. Um, and uh, and then. Um, you can go up for refinements then. Are you racing? Are you cr 
cruising or are you, um, you know, or distance cruising, what, what are you doing? Or, or, you know, and we're, we're, we lean to sailboats, but all this is true of power vessels too, of course. And, uh, um, and actually, you know, there's a boat we work on that, um, uh, my friend won't mind me telling you, this, this is the only boat he's ever owned. It's a 42 foot monk sedan cruiser. And he has learned and done, uh, he's owned it for about 25 years now. And he went from knowing nothing to he's ready to go to Alaska now. Wow. Yeah. That's great. And the boat is so solid. It's better than it ever was. That's great. And he's had, he's been well north, um, you know, subsequently, yeah. but, um, and has many stories and, uh, many adventures. And he just loves this idea because, uh, of, uh, of a vessel, a stewardship plan, because it finally put for him in focus, all the things that he's been teaching himself what to do, mm. um, mm -hmm. all this time. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, and he's uh, you know capable, so he's done his own wiring and uh, his own plumbing, and uh, it, it's been really a joy to work with him. Yeah. And a lot of my um, clients are you know become my friends, so that that's part of this whole thing again, seeking expertise, um, and uh, it's a lot of relationships uh, are valuable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. The the thing that I had forgotten that came back to me. For this section is you know why did we say improve your vessel that seems kind of like a no-brainer and i guess it goes sort of to our our core um, belief that stewardship isn't just maintaining the status quo although that is extremely important but any good steward leaves it better than when they got it that's you know whether you're a forest steward or a wooden boat steward you know the idea is to improve what you have not just maintain it, leave it better. And, and I just wanted to, to hit that home because that was part of the, at least for me, part of the driving reason we have this section of improve your vessel, which can feel kind of like a no brainer. And then- yeah, Oh, did you want to do one big, one small? Yeah, yeah. The, the other thing that you'll notice in italics, one big, one small, that was just a, another tidbit that I got from a, a previous captain. Um, it's, a, it, it's about, when you're maintaining your vessel, you always want to go sailing. Uh, you want to choose manageable goals, which you've mentioned earlier. And so this, this one captain's advice or, or method for his maintenance was every winter he did one big project, one small project. That might have looked like a new mainsail for his schooner uh, and you know, repitching part of the, the side deck. One big, one small. But by going through that process, he always went sailing and he continually improved his vessel and stayed on top of his maintenance and he could plan for it. He, uh, he knew, okay, I'm gonna get my new mainsail this year and I need a new staysail next year. And I have to you know, recock some seams on the starboard bow, et cetera. And he could just, in that mentality, it was easier for him to make a plan moving into the future. So it doesn't have to be everybody's a technique for, for maintenance and improving your vessel. I just thought it was a pretty simple rule of thumb. I um, mean, it's one that I've tried to bring to my little 23 foot fiberglass sloop. You know, my wife and I try to do one big and one small every winter. Yeah. And then there's the way too, that we've uh, surveyed vessels together. And um, so, you know, we find out that um, for example, the fasteners are deteriorating, but they don't need to be done this year. And the, and uh, fortunately the planks aren't falling off the boat. So um, the corking is probably not disturbed yet, but um, sure enough, let's make sure we get that done in the next five years and right. it'll cost about this much money. So, uh, um, you know, that, that's a way to take the shock out of vessel ownership so that you can afford it and, and still use your boat. Uh, the boat doesn't then come into the yard and come all apart and you don't have any money and you, you, you know and it just knocks the wind out of the boat stock yeah, yeah right so we're trying to, to be avoid that yeah uh -huh. yeah and do it in manageable pieces while preserving the safety of the vessel and by leaning on your experts you're gonna have a better idea of what your boat needs and thereby helping you plan and hopefully financially save for some of these upcoming projects rather than oh gosh, you know, my prop falls off or a plank springs and all of a sudden you're in crisis mode trying to fix something that 
maybe would have been caught uh, if you're doing sort of this ongoing uh, stewardship of land. Yeah, and it again makes the insurance people happy too because <laughs> you know you can For show sure. them that you're ahead of the problem, not behind them. For sure. And it used to be, you know, when um, wooden boats were worth more in the economy, you know, the rule of thumb was maybe um, s put aside 10% of the vessel's um, uh, val value a year. If you don't spend it, then you'll be spending it later when you do repower or buy your new set of sails. But that way you you actually have a bank account that goes with this planning. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's um, separate money. And again, that helps you afford a plan ahead and afford the things it's going to cost you. It's you just especially in this day and age, can't do it on a shoestring. I think uh, we've... Well, I have one more oh, thing yeah, to add yeah. to that. Um, and that's to uh, yeah, um, crawl through your vessel every year. Lift up your cabin sole, um, yes. get rid of things that are falling apart or rotting or you're not using, uh, vacuum, inspect, look for leaks. Uh, you know, this is all common sense stuff, but just, just that day it takes you could actually be fun, I hope. And it gets all the detritus out of the corners so that won't rot and it'll smell better and you just um and it's just so much better for everybody who comes behind you um and so uh, if i could share anything that would be good i mean one of the first things i do when i step on a boat is i want to know how it smells mm -hmm. um it just goes off it tells me some things about absolutely it. Uh -huh. yeah and plus you'll it's preventative i mean i'm telling you guys all common sense stuff but You'll see the little diesel leak uh, from the stove before it becomes a problem. You'll, you'll see the exhaust leak if there is one. You'll see the, the stanchion base leaking and, and any of that kind of thing. Well, so the next spoke on the wheel is developing crew. Uh, and this, this goes hand in hand with seeking expertise or creating expertise. Uh, but developing crew is, is really... I mean, I guess if you don't like people and you just want to go sailing by yourself, then maybe this boat doesn't apply to you. But I, I feel that generally, boat people uh, like to be around one another. And uh, especially if you're doing <laughs> not ocean passage or anything. Uh, but anyway, developing crew is something that, that spans uh, all sizes of boats, all purposes of boats. And Developing crew means that you need to find people who are interested in, you need to test them out, bring them aboard, how do you get along, um, and then recognizing your limitations as a captain, uh, recognizing their limitations as crew, uh, working through those things, uh, ongoing training. I mean, developing crew is really ongoing training, not just for them, but for, for us as both owners and stewards as well. And, and it's setting goals together too. Yeah. Um, so now you're in a you know, uh, situation where you are creating goals together and achieving them. It's mm -hmm. sort of the outward bound model. I forgot the words for what they call it. It's a, it's a curve, you know, where you, you set out your expectations and your goals, you work to achieve it, you achieve it, and then you get to enjoy that mm -hmm. and set your next goal. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a very powerful human experience. It's really powerful. It's one of my favorite things. And it goes back to, that's, you know, again, one of my reasons for owning a boat. Is I love the community aspect. And, uh, like, I, I remember being on the Schooner Adventurous as a crew member. And, you know, we work all season to train people up and get them you know, working like a well-oiled machine. And some of the most powerful experiences I had on that boat were when we would do silent maneuvers, leaving a dock, silent, setting sails, silently. And all those crew members, they knew what to do, where to be, what hand signals to look for from the captain. It was magic. I mean, it just gives me chills thinking about it. It was magic. And so developing crew, working with crew, it can be a really powerful reason to own a boat and a really powerful part of your stewardship plan. Especially not not only because it maybe is accomplishing your goals of getting underway, um, but it can lead to potential ownership succession. You know, some of these people who you have now sailed with for years, maybe you want to bring them in and make them part owner, or maybe you're ready to wash your hands of the vessel entirely, and rather than putting it up uh, on some brokerage website, you could pass it on to somebody who knows it, loves it, and wants to keep it going. So. Again, developing crew can be a 
really powerful part of this entire stewardship plan. I know for me personally, like growing up with my kids on the boat and everything, and then I went through the period where they couldn't care less or, or only sure. slept. Sure, sure. <laughs> but, but now, well, I haven't experienced that yet, but I'm sure my time will come. <laughs> but now, as adults, um, it, we have the most fun. I mean, we have all this common, yeah, um, sure. Yeah, and, um, and then they're friends too, and it brings us all closer. I mean, we have this whole language yeah. to share and these places we've been, and we visit them again. And, um, you know, what is the thing in the uh, Tao Te Ching about uh, it's the space within a vessel that makes it useful. So what we put in our vessels uh, is a lot of things. Uh, includes the people we bring aboard. Right, right. Uh, and one more thing about cruise. Um, I've been lucky to have um, people with a lot of sea experience sail as part of my crew. And I've, <laughs> lately, uh, it seems like we're all getting older, and some of those people, and me included, uh, don't get around quite as well. And I. Uh, was sailing in a race last year and I realized that oh my I have to run the whole deck now <laughs> but there's great stories from the after guard and they're yeah. steering you know steering very well back there thank you very much and it, it just <laughs> made me realize though that um my expectations of my crew uh had to catch up with the times sure and not only that I, I you know I had more responsibility sure. um and so yeah there you go yeah we're constantly reevaluating yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so that takes us to the next spoke, uh, good records, keeping good records. This is huge. Uh, <laughs> nothing, no, that's a strong statement, but it fills me with a lot of joy when I go aboard a boat and they, they pull out a big plastic file folder box and it is well organized, maybe using a label maker and I can find whatever I want about that boat, whether it's a service manual, maintenance records, receipts, ships diagrams, it just, it really truly, it's its kind of sad, really, now that I think about it, but it really fills me with a lot of joy. <laughs> you are a boat geek. <laughs> but, um, oh my gosh, it's just amazing. But, but also, not only does it make my job a little easier in that moment, but it speaks a lot to their ownership for me. These people are organized. They are taking care of their vessel. Here are the maintenance logs to show for it. Um, keeping good records is really a powerful thing for the vessel, both as you're using it so that you have the resources at hand while you're using the vessel, but also should you go to pass on that vessel, you have excellent records of what you've done, how you've cared for it, the money you've spent. We all know that you don't get back what you put into the boats. Um, but at least it shows that you have really taken care. So yeah, keeping good records is amazing. Yeah, I've written um, just one page synopsis of work for the Coast Guard or for um, even owners, because some of the projects we get in um, are so big that I try to, we all write down what we did every day and try to keep good notes as a progression you can see um, within those documents. But um, just to have a summation of that can be really handy. So that then in the maintenance log, oh, you know, 2020, we did X, Y, and Z. And uh, in 2024, we need to pick up here at, at A again, Yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, let's see. So there's a lot of ways to keep good records. And you had the uh, idea of uh, what Motor Vessel Girona does there. Yeah, if, if folks haven't heard of this before, I, I posted a link to it to the resources page, and the URL is right there up under my logo. But uh, Dirona is a, a large you know, ocean cruising trawler, and they, they have an excellently nerdy Excel spreadsheet for maintenance. And they, they have worked its magic somehow where they put in the systems that they have and then, uh, when they need to do certain maintenance items. And as they get closer to needing those items, it changes color from green to yellow to red. It's past due, you need to do this maintenance. Uh, they offer this Excel spreadsheet for free on their website and I believe some explanation on how to use it. Uh, it's just a really, <laughs> really incredible tool that I don't use personally because it goes a little over my head. But if 
if that suits you, if you think like that, it could be a really powerful online document or, or Excel document for you. But then, you know, there's always the classic ways of just writing it down on, on a piece of paper, um, keeping logbooks, filing your receipts, keeping your manuals easily sorted, uh, <laughs> updating your vessel stewardship plan, and uh, keeping, I really like to see previous surveys. Actually, when I go aboard and I'm doing a survey, I'll often say, do you have any, any previous surveys? Because it's great to see where the vessel has come from and what other surveyors were calling out as part of their recommendation. Have those things been resolved? Oh no, otherwise it leads me straight to a problem. Like, yep, it's still a problem. So uh, oftentimes those aren't made available to me, especially during some sales, but, uh -huh. um, but when they are available, they can be really, really powerful tools too. So it's the most way of the records. Um, well, and going on and finding um, information about your boat, it, sometimes it's amazing what is out there that you don't know about um, in archives, in uh, books, uh, like the library at the Maritime Center is amazing. Um, you know, if you have a historic vessel, that is. Um, and photographs too. We don't have photographs. Oh, on yeah. 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 And, um, and trying to um, keep current a photo record because yes. that's um, is so valuable to me. Such a great thing. Yeah, uh -huh. for me as well. Having photos of your vessel. Um, looks like we have a question about insurance coming in. We'll take that in a minute. Um, yeah, I think that's a long, good discussion yeah. point. So for sure. thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're doing good on time. Let's um, go to get underway because that's really what it's all about, right? Um, we, you know, we, we want to make sure that everybody gets off the dock and goes and has fun on their boat. It's better for you and it's better for the boat. boat. Right. Yeah, right? Get underway. Um, yeah, make time to reward your efforts. And, 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 but, you know, there are those people who just like to work on their boat and they don't go out very much. And that's okay, too, of course. That is. I hope they turn their boats once in a while. But that's just me. Right. But um, so the whole idea is, um, you know, in this plan, make time to go do the things that you're planning to do. And, um, and uh, you also will learn things about your boat. Um, too, and that will inform your um, stewardship plan. Uh, you know, you might get in a sea state you've never been in, or you might um, realize you don't have enough water for what you want to do, or um, at least innumerable things, uh, you know, especially um, around sailboats too, with uh, sail handling and sail combinations. And, um, well, and that, and I mean, that just leads right back around the spokes again, right? Because the more you use your vessel, you might realize that you have new goals that you want to set or things that you want to change or systems that you want to revise. And so then you make that goal, you seek the expertise, you affect that change, you and your crew go out and enjoy it. And then maybe you set a new goal, <laughs> you know, it's just, that's why, again, it's a, it's a living document. And, uh, but really using your boat is, is really the best for you and, and best for the boat. Um, we, we never want you to take on so much that you don't use the boat that you feel overwhelmed. This can feel like a really overwhelming process, right? This is a lot to consider, but ultimately we hope that if you do this legwork up front and continue to chip away at it, it'll help you have a better time aboard your boat and, and help that boat persist, improve, and get passed on, particularly with, with our historic wooden boats, help them be passed on more easily to the next gen. Yeah, it looks like uh, Paul here says he wants to reinforce the idea of to developing of developing your own skills to assist in boat upkeep. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, significant money can be saved for the specialized tasks <laughs> by developing your own skills to assist in routine maintenance. Absolutely. absolutely. And again, that's chipping away at it too, you know, try to get a little done uh, or uh, well, can be more than a little, but the simple things done. Uh -huh. um, painting, varnishing and topsides caulking are all simple skills to learn and rewarding. Definitely rewarding. Yeah, great. Engine tuning. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like we're done, done with our diagram. Um, yeah, we were going to recap a little bit, just encouraging people to um, to uh, think strategically and make a plan. And um, there's lots of good reasons to do that. And um, these spokes are 
the framework for for actually building your own plan. And um, and and maybe maybe some people have already created a similar plan, which we're excited to hear about in the next section. Um, yeah, and we don't want to take away at all from what everybody else is thinking about this. So yeah, we can. We would love to hear your your ideas and your experiences so that we might improve this uh, process for, for all boat owners. Um, should we, I guess, Barb, maybe we can take this down and we'll just launch into questions. Okay, um, Scott Andrews, is this more of a comment? Thank you, this is very helpful. You've provided a structure to all those records I have and provided a very helpful additional items I need to consider. Um, oh, thanks, Scott. Nice. Um, and then in the insurance one that Douglas Fisher asked, one of the biggest problems you have touched on is insurance. I have an older boat. It has a current survey. Finding insurance is proving very difficult. And the, and the same has been tried with others I've spoken with. Is it possible to do an entire session on getting insurance and dealing with insurance companies? I have to add that that's like the number one question we get at the Maritime Center at the Wooden Boat Festival is where can I get insurance? So I was thinking the exact same thing. That would be amazing to have a conversation about that. We actually have a little bit of time if you want to get into it. Um, and, and Zach uh, and I were talking about this and he had the foresight to um, call some insurance brokers and uh, really get yeah. it and underwriters and get up to date um, because we deal with a lot of um, different insurance insurance situations all the time and uh, we wanted to know that we were current and uh, you can probably sum it up better than I but. yeah uh, well the summary is just like you have all experienced it's getting harder uh, there are insurance carriers who have just dropped all older boats flat out they're not going to cover them anymore. And that's sent a lot of boat owners scrambling to find insurance. Um, the insurance folks that I reached out to were, uh, and they're on the list of resources under the insurance section, but I reached out to Haggerty, which is now underwritten by Markel. So really you can consider those both just Markel. Um, there's Heritage and Red Shield, which is based out of Oregon. Those are the three big ones that I was able to connect with. Um, I believe those are the only ones underwriting uh, wooden boat insurance in the United States. That's yeah. what I understand. Uh -huh. I spoke with an insurance broker uh, in Seattle, blanking on the name of his brokerage, but he basically said five years ago, he had multiple wooden boat markets for people. He, he just didn't have a, a hard time getting insurance. And just in the last five years, uh, he's gone down to two, one or two. Uh, markets that will accept wooden boats. It's been really hard for him to find insurance for wooden boats. Um, it seems to me that there are some people who are being grandfathered in under their insurance. They've been with the same insurance for decades and they just kind of continue uh, along. But when that boat goes up for sale, uh, the next potential buyers have a, a much harder time finding insurance. Oh, and we should mention that there's a new law in Washington state that you can't um, transfer title without insurance. And so if you make an offer on a vessel, make sure to have it, that offer contingent on getting insurance. Yeah, that this was actually a big deal. That same insurance broker said that he'll often put a line in his contracts that say, you know, sale is pending, uh, you know, getting, getting insurance, insurance. To the boat, uh, which I'd never heard of before, but I think is a, a pretty solid idea. Now, Red Shield seems to be pretty available to um, the average boat owner um, with the caveat that the boat needs to be um, something similar to within 10 feet, right? Uh, uh, yeah, it was either 10 or 12 feet, depending on the insurance company. Of what uh, vessel you've operated in the past, and you have to show that you have some knowledge. Oh, uh, you know, that reminds me that we we're going to recommend that people get their captain's licenses yeah just as a, as a good idea which i've heard helps lower your insurance but, but anyway yeah. um yeah red shield the insurance underwriter i spoke to down there he was like i'm not afraid of wooden boats which was really encouraging to hear especially after having had the conversation with the broker who's like it's getting so much harder to find insurance for wooden boats so uh that was encouraging uh and that red shield underwriter said that uh there isn't too much different about getting insurance for a wooden boat than um, 
motor or a fiberglass boat these days or a metal hull boat, but that he would require uh, especially inexperienced boat owners to show some kind of a resume of credentials or experience uh, that they're it would be pretty much no problem for them to get insurance if they could show, like you said, a similar size and type. Um, and then if you're, say, an operator of a wooden boat, but you don't own it, that's also much easier for you to get ownership of a wooden boat. But if you're a 26-year-old who thinks living on a wooden boat in Lake Union is going to be cool and uh, cheaper than rent, you're going to be in for a big surprise. Uh, you're going to have a real hard time getting insurance. So, I mean, ultimately, it's hard. Uh, it seems like it's getting harder to get insurance for wooden boats. And partially what we're hoping is that if people create plans like this, uh, it might help alleviate some, I don't know, some of that trepidation that uh, insurance underwriters seem to have. I think boat insurance in general is harder to come by too. I mean, uh, unfortunately, you know, there's a housing crisis and, and People are moving on to boats, and one way that uh, that's being modulated is through insurance. I, would, I mean, I would love to continue to have this conversation specifically with more insurance underwriters and brokers in the area. Um, I called around to more people than got back a hold of me, so it's uh, it's definitely something. I know also that the I believe it's the Wooden Boat Forum on Facebook. There's been a lot of uh, discussion about who insures and people's experience with, with different insurers. And there were certainly more thrown out there than uh, the few that we've mentioned here. But again, I, it just really seems to vary uh, person to person, boat to boat. I think we should put together something for Wooden Boat Festival, um, since it is such a common, like have some kind of resources and talk there. That'd be great. Um, okay, Carol McCreary has a call. Uh, Question, important stuff. I'm wondering how marine tradespeople feel about owners hanging around during repairs so we can be ready to manage on long cruises. Well, as a marine tradesperson, we like it when, I mean, as long as owners can be safe and respectful, you know, um, they're welcome to work with us. Um, it gets their boat further and they know more about it, as Carol's implying. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's true would be as useful, um, say, on the electrical side or mechanical side, just because you're maybe more in the way. But uh, to me, that, that doesn't mean you couldn't uh, participate some, or at least certainly be shown what's happening on a uh, real-time basis, because it's that seems like you ought to get that knowledge with what you're paying for. Um, I just don't see a downside. Uh, um, so I hope that no matter where you went, you'd get that benefit. Yeah. I mean, my, I'm, my job isn't repair specific, but uh, sort of related, I always encourage people to be with me during surveys. I think it is such an invaluable opportunity for people to get to know their boat, whether they own the boat and they just need an insurance survey or if it's a potential buyer potentially you know, buying the boat, uh, coming aboard, going through all the systems, looking at all the nooks and crannies, asking questions, uh, it's just too good of an opportunity for their education and sometimes for mine honestly like when uh, I'm working alongside or doing an insurance survey for somebody who's owned their boat for a long time they're, they're able to show me this that or the other I made this repair or this problem exists um, so I, I often end up learning from people and then we can learn on our own time just as much as being able to share knowledge uh, well Thanks for yeah. questions, everybody. Does anybody have anything else? Um, everybody see the chat, I, I can read it. Any comments on the state um, of the marine trades dash old timers retiring and no next generation? Uh, what, yeah, I think it's a missing generation. I think that's true in all the trades um, around the world, really, um, that the, the 40 year olds uh, with experience and um, well, energy and experience together, um, are are missing you know the uh society emphasized computers then uh, our the high schools took away the vocation vocational tech um 
And so I don't know what the answer is there. And unfortunately, things are so much more expensive now that it's hard um, to build up capital um, as a young person. I am, there are, I mean, I'm enthused by how many 20 something and young 30 are in the trade and, um, and still figuring out on boats and doing it. So I, that's part of the reason I stay involved. Um, 10 years ago, I wasn't sure if, if it could stay on. Uh, and, you know, places like Seattle just don't seem to care about their marine history and it's just getting too expensive there. So, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, I think that's the real problem is that, uh, well, and now, especially with the pandemic and all the coastline places being bought up by people with far more money than the trades people. Right. Uh, I, I don't really know what the solution is, but um, yeah, I'm not, um, I just see a leadership problem coming. I don't see an enthusiasm problem. I, uh, I feel really encouraged by the amount of young folks that are coming into the trades. I mean, it, it's not staggering numbers but you see a lot of initiatives all up and down Puget Sound to get people involved from you know the Maritime High School in South Seattle you've got uh, Seattle Community College the Wooden Boat School Skagit Valley College uh, you've got great on the water programs for youth you've got training centers at the Northwest Maritime Center and I mean uh, there there are just so many resources being spent right now to bring more people into the trades which I loved um, but yeah like Andy is mentioning there just seems to be a generational gap. There's, there's my generation and the folks who are a little younger than me and then there's this gap and then there's Andy's generation. In surveying, when I go to a surveyor's conference, I'm the youngest person there by probably 20 years. Um, and, and I love it because there's so much great experience in the room. I just wish there were more folks like me there. Um, and that's part of the reason I got into surveying is because I saw, wow, like there are so many surveyors who are getting ready to retire I'm going to lose all that knowledge. We, the maritime industry, is going to lose all that knowledge. So, I'm trying to suck it all up uh, as best I can. But, uh, and I see that in, in other members of my generation, whether they're hanging planks on wooden boats or uh, doing marine systems, which are exploding. There's, there's a lot of thirst for that knowledge. But, like Andy said, it's, it's, it's getting tough uh, financially. There seems uh, like there's plenty of work though, right? Like there's plenty uh, of work to be done. Oh yeah. Yeah, the problem is, is what's really a living wage, you know, and what do, what does housing cost? Uh, and, you know, you just can't, and you can't, even if you look at it from the home builder perspective, like people can't afford to build their own boats anymore because you have to do it in Montana because you can't <laughs> do it close to the water. Everything's too expensive and then the parts too expensive and then the mortgage is unavailable and so it's becoming this kind of more elitist situation so there's there's plenty of work but um you know the nature of the work is changing so yeah uh, hopefully this stuff uh has been you know valuable or will be valuable um i'm going to use some of this i mean oh yeah yeah well, we'll, we'll continue to uh, yeah, we'll just continue to refine it. And maybe you and I can work together to do this for some vessels. And, um, but yeah, if anybody wants to or comes up with any ideas of things that they're currently doing or resources that we're missing from our list of resources, feel free to email or call Andy and I. Uh, send me a text message. Be happy to put up appropriate resources onto that list. Yeah, or more questions too. Yeah. We're happy to answer questions. Yeah. Thank you all for showing up. I yeah. guess we're, we're good. Thank you. <laughs> well, great. Thank you so much, you guys. That was really informative and it um, really uh, got me thinking about that insurance topic and how much more we can be uh, maybe be serving the public at Wooden Boat Festival even more. So I'm excited to talk to you about that. And again, you guys, thank you so much. Great information. I really appreciate you both taking your time to be with us here tonight. Um, okay, everyone. Thank you so much. We'll see you at the next Wooden Boat Festival. <laughs>